Welcome, everybody. My name is Seth Williams. I'm here with my co-host, Jaron Barnes. This is the RE Tipster Podcast. And um, today we have a really interesting interview with a guy named Brian Kurtz. Uh, Brian is uh, of the company Titan Marketing, and he's been in the direct marketing business before the internet was born. So going back to like the 1980s, uh, he specializes in direct mail, and he's overseen the mailing of over a billion, with a B, mail pieces over the last 20 years. It's actually probably like more like a couple billion, um, as we talk more about in this interview. Um, but, uh, Jaron met Brian at a Perry Marshall event uh, recently and heard him speak about the power of offline marketing and he jumped at the opportunity to get Brian on the show. So, uh, now, you know, Brian, he doesn't just do direct mail, but that is one of his areas of specialty. And that's part of why we wanted to talk to him because direct mail is a huge part of our business. Uh, I mean, that's kind of like the lifeblood of how we get deals. It's not the only way to get deals, but it, it does happen to be a very, very effective and efficient way to do it. If you, you know, get all of the uh, uh, things tweaked and fine tuned so that your lists actually produce results. Um, so I know just speaking for myself, the first time I did a direct mail campaign was back in 2008 and I'd never done direct mail before. I was kind of skeptical about whether this thing was going to work. I just felt like I was doing a huge gamble and rolling the dice and possibly losing hundreds of dollars just trying this thing out. Uh, but I was lucky enough to get a really good list and I spent hours really refining it and making sure it was a really good list with a good compelling message in my direct mail piece. And I was just blown away by the results because it was like, it was just ultimately like just a lot easier for me to find deals that way compared to all the other ways I had tried which, you know, calling random people and, you know, getting on the MLS and trying to find deals there. Like direct mail was a hundred times easier to find deals than all those other uh, methods were. So I know direct mail works. I've been using it for a long time now. That's really, it's kind of like one of the main ways that we teach in terms of how to find deals in our business. Um, but uh, Jaron, you want to say anything about uh, Brian before we get into this? Yeah. So I actually asked Seth to, um, to let's make an intro for this one because there were a couple of things that we talked that were kind of marketing jargon or marketing language. And uh, he explained it, but there, I just wanted to kind of give supplementary explanation to, to RFM specifically. And then I also wanted to mention uh, something about why he suggests from a principal level, like what's happening in the, the ether behind his words on why he says that it would be good with the direct mail postcard to offer a free consultation. So I'll go with that one first. The reason why at a high level, I was actually just reading about it today before the interview, why he specifically uses the word free in your offer instead of call today if you offer, get a free something, free consultation, free whatever, there's something that they've done all these tests in marketing to say that when they, they actually did a test with college students where they offered a piece of candy for like 26 cents and a piece of candy for a cent. And what they did was uh, they tested it, that out as kind of the control group and there was more people who bought the more expensive candy. But when they dropped both by one cent, making one free, immediately everybody gravitated to the free candy, regardless of the fact that the truffle, the more expensive candy, was a higher quality ca candy and if given the ability to buy one or the other, even though one was much cheaper, the one that was more expensive was winning. But the minute they made it free, people, for whatever reason, were always getting the free candy. And they actually did a test where it said, they, they said, okay, what if we made this like a negative where we're like, I don't know, maybe they like paid somebody a cent, like you got a candy and a cent. I don't know. But they said in the book that I was reading that they, they somehow tested making it an, like um, a minus one, you know, type deal instead of free. And in that case scenario, the more expensive candy still won. But the minute they, they threw the word free in there for whatever reason, people love free and they resonate with free. So even if it's something as silly as like a free phone call or a free consultation, that there's data to suggest that you're going to have a higher response rate there. Uh, the what, next what book was that, Jaren? Dot com secrets by Russell Brunson. Ah, okay, cool. Yeah. 
So yeah, Russell Brenson is actually really solid. Click Funnels, I am a big fan. I really like his heart, and he actually has really, really powerful stuff. So um, he comes highly recommended. Now going to RFM, R is recent, F is frequent, and M stands for money. But money isn't a best representation there because it could be money or it could be time. And this is kind of one of those weird kind of universal laws similar to the 80-20 principle where if you, in the context that we're talking about it is within business and in marketing, but it works anywhere. So you're going to have a much more engaged audience with people that you have dealt with recently, people that you deal with all the time or frequently, and people who either have given you some kind of a money component in the context of business, people who buy from you the most or give you the most money. It could work in text messages. Perry Marshall actually uses an example of, you know, if you look at your phone, the people that you text that are at the top of who you're texting are people you've texted most, uh, most recently, most frequently, and who send you the most amount of text in terms of volume. So mass amounts of like, you know, those textbooks, right? Like, you know what I'm talking about? So, uh, just so you are aware, just as a primer to what RFM is, it's a universal, it's used a lot in marketing because if you can figure out how to optimize your marketing efforts with customers that you deal with recently, frequently, or who pay you the most amount of money, those are the people that you want to target when you have a new product or you have something that you want to upsell or something different that you want to do or you, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to give that primer so that it's a lot more uh, because at some point we're going back and forth and there's a lot of marketing jargon and I want this to be the most one, you know, I want our content to be extremely val valuable. So I just wanted to give a primer there. So with that, uh, we're going to jump into the interview now, push play and you guys can listen to what we talked about. I hope you find some of it helpful and yeah, we'll talk to you after the show. Hello everybody. How's it going? This is Seth Williams and Jaron Barnes from the RE Tipster podcast we have an awesome guest on today's show. His name is Brian Kurtz. He's been in the direct mail marketing business before the internet was born, literally going back to the early 1980s. Wow, that's like prehistoric <laughs> era, man. That's what I was about to say. I was Pretty like, much. are you hanging out with dinosaurs? Dinosaurs man? were roaming the <laughs> earth. My, my email is T-Rex, absolutely. <laughs> This is back when the world was in black and white. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, you remember, what I, I said to you before we got on the phone, the Big Bang Theory is that there was a Big Bang, and at the same time the earth was formed, so was the internet. But that's the way most people in online marketing today see the world. Now, Brian, you know, he specializes in direct mail, and he's overseen the mailing of over a billion, with a B, mail pieces over the past 20 years. Jaron met Brian recently at a Perry Marshall event. Perry was on episode 33, in case you didn't hear that. Uh, but Jaron heard Brian speak about the power of offline marketing and jumped at the opportunity to ask Brian to come on the show. So we're really happy to have Brian. Um, now, before we get into this, I'll just kind of explain a little bit about my perspective here. I know, you know not all real estate investors use direct mail as a way of getting deals because apparently some of them just like to work a lot harder to find opportunities for some reason. But I know the first time I used direct mail back in 2008, I was you know, pretty skeptical. My idea of direct mail was you know, when I get some you know, horribly written mass solicitation from a big dumb company, and I just, it didn't make That's sense owned to me. by Brian. Well, not only that, no, not only that, there's like small dumb companies like real estate agents who send out the card about the, the houses. Not a bad idea to talk about the houses they sold around your house, and now I want to sell yours. There's nothing wrong with that approach. It's just that they all look the same. And the fact is that if you're going to do lookalike marketing in direct mail, you might as well not spend the money. But I'm glad that you mm -hmm. see that there is a potential and also, if you're selling something as high ticket as a house or land or anything like that, the additional expense that direct mail has over email pays for itself very, very quickly because you only need one, you know, one, one sale in your world is equivalent to my old world of selling $39 subscriptions. I needed to sell thousands and thousands mm -hmm. to make my direct mail work. So mm -hmm. there's direct mail and there's direct mail and we can talk about you know, what I did, you know, I wasn't bragging when I said I, I, and I've mailed probably in my career close to 2 billion pieces, but that's not a brag. That's just to say that there's all kinds of direct mail 
And so mailing two billion and mailing 200, the concepts behind targeted direct mail are actually the same. Mm -hmm. I always say we had a 9 million name database at my old company and mailing to 900 people, it's the same principles, which we can talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something that uh, Jaren thought, thought about ahead of time, I'm really glad he did. To make this conversation more interesting, uh, Jaren sent Brian a sample of his own direct mail marketing postcard, which is one that he has really made you know, on his own. It's nothing that I've really, I've actually used it before, but Jaren I mean, created this thing from scratch. And we're gonna get Brian's take on how it stacks up you know, whether he thinks it's going to get the results we're aiming for, and most importantly, what kind of things he would change about it. So it's going to be really interesting. Brian, welcome to the show. Should, uh, we, dive into, uh, yeah, should we dive into Jaren's postcard? But, it, by the you way, know, we're going to have we a, do a... Let's do a few questions first so I can give you like a state <clears> of the <throat> union. You can ask me some basic questions about direct mail. Because if I start, I, I, I will, you know, I will talk in extensively about this. It's not a lot of copy, so it's not going to take me that long, mm -hmm. but I, I've got a lot of thoughts about it, but I want to get a better sense of, you know, what your audience needs, what they want to learn. And mm -hmm. so I think a lot of the questions that Jared prepared in advance might be a better place to start, but we will jump into this. Yeah, that sounds good. But I, I want you to promise me before we go into other questions that like my goal with this postcard and like critique is I want to like cry after this interview. Like I want you to really rip it apart. Do not be nice to me. Do not try to like, like be worried about, you know, offending me or whatever. Like I really want the audience to get value from this. Like I'm going to put a sample of my before and after postcard right here in the show notes. And I'm actually going to test it out based off the, the feedback that you give me. And, and by the way, the, the thing you test doesn't have to be another postcard, just so you know. Yeah. I just, and I, yeah. Your mind's got to, got to go completely yeah. open because direct mail is not one format, which you, one of your questions was about that. Yeah. And let's actually dive into that. So one of the questions that, you know, I had for you, man, was, postcards versus yellow letters versus handwritten notes versus like birthday cards versus like sending a video in the mail. You can actually do that now. You can get a video embedded into a card and send it out. Like what's the best option for us real estate investors? You know what? The answer is it depends, which you knew that was going to be my answer. <laughs> but here's the thing. One of the things I said right from the outset is that everybody jumps to postcards. And the reason they jump to postcards is that they're cheap, they're easy to do, you know you're going to get immediate attention, no one has to open an envelope, they don't need a letter opener if they have arthritis, whatever, right? I mean, for whatever reasons, postcards seem to be easily accessible. Postcards come with a huge problem. They come with a problem is that, talk about real estate, a different type of real estate, is you only have this real estate and this real estate. Yeah. So if you really want to have a copy approach that's powerful, tells a story, talks about the reason for your being and why you're showing up in someone's mailbox, this doesn't give you a lot of room. I'm throwing yeah. it around here. <laughs> this doesn't give you a lot of room, but it can be effective and it's fine for certain types of things. Now let's take another step. You're selling, I'm assuming when you're selling land, to, I guess your business is mostly about flipping land, um, it feels very commoditized. As you said, you're not fixing up the houses. You're just buying the land low and selling high. So it looks like all I am is a flipper of, of, you know, of grass and so, and not, and not cannabis, which is another whole business. <laughs> itself. Um, and a hot one to say the least. But my, my thought is that, you know, if, if any, first of all, whatever your competitors are doing, if they're all doing postcards, it's time to not do postcards. Hmm. You know, you always want to think about if everyone's going right, go left. So I'm not going to answer your question literally when you said what's best, like is a postcard, yellow letter, handwritten. There's no one thing that's best. I mean, if, I heard you say that, that you hate postcards. So well, I, don't, give it a push I only hate them because I'm a, I'm a student of copy. I, I've studied with all the great, I'm not a copywriter but I've studied with all the great copywriters. I've worked with all the great copywriters in my career. So to me, you're kind of like not, you're not going to be able to differentiate as much on a postcard as you would in a four page or a six page letter. Mm -hmm. And so to me, the intrigue of, especially because you're selling something that's fairly high ticket. I mean, I'm assuming most of the land you sell is more than like, you know, 
fifteen dollars, right? It's like you well, know, and, to, and to be clear, when we're sending these postcards out, it's to buy property. It's not to sell it. You're buying their property, right? Correct. Yeah, but to buy their property, we're not buying property at you know for twenty dollar bills. Yeah, okay. we're. Sometimes you buy them for like $250 to $1,000. Okay, can't. so it's, it but that's still fairly high ticket if you compare it to like a $39 newsletter or a 20% discount on coming into my Chinese restaurant or, you know, I'll give you free dry cleaning. It's just, it, it, you're, by, by, by doing this, you're now locked into a category called, you know, commoditized uh, direct mail. Could work. And you said this is working. So, you know, I just want to make it work better. I'm not saying what I'm going to talk can you expand, about. When, when you say commoditized, what, what do you mean when you're saying that? So just, to me, a commodity, I mean, the commo uh, long distance telephone service, it's a commodity. I mean, yes, in your area, Verizon might be, have more cell towers than AT&T. But ultimately, when you want, when you're selling commodity, you're always selling on price. Mm -hmm. and you're not selling on features and benefits. Yeah. And so that would be the easiest way to describe a commodity versus a specialty. The interesting thing is that the best advertisements for commodity has turned commodity into specialty. What about insurance? I mean, I, I, you know, we all love Geico. I mean, Geico, Geico has turned like general advertising into an art form, and now there's a commercial where you can buy like a DVD of all the greatest Geico commercials. So their commercials become part of the art and then you're part of this family called Geico and whether you're saving $15 or $500 on car insurance is almost irrelevant because you're now in this family of something that was a commodity. I mean, you know, insurance is a commodity whether yeah. we like it or not and it's almost always based on price. So then what are the other things you can differentiate on? Customer service is a huge one. How you fulfill on the back end, how you repeat on your orders, you know, continuity. So, for example, if you can create something where buying land from somebody is not a one-shot deal. Some people only have one piece of land to sell you. My guess is there are people that you've sold to that might have multiple pieces of land in their portfolio. Why wouldn't you want to be the only person that they come to when they want to sell land, as opposed to the one-shot deal on the one that's available now? So that speaks to another aspect of commodity specialty, which is what I call episodic marketing. Episodic marketing is like, yes, they might be inclined to sell because of your postcard, or they might be waiting for it to increase in value, or they just might not be ready to sell. So how do you become, instead of the buyer-seller transactional marketer, how do you become an advisor, someone who they trust before they entrust the transaction to you. I'll tell two quick stories. Um, two commodities. And so I can really get this drilled in before we start talking about specific copy approaches. But I'll talk about, I, I wrote a blog post. I called it the one about the used car salesman. Used cars are, even though every used car on the lot is different. So you could say, well, they're all specialty. This one doesn't have air conditioning. And this one has 50,000 miles instead of 100,000 miles. But which used car salesman you go to gets commoditized because all you are is going somewhere when you're in the market for a used car. What do most used car lots do when they market? And I've worked with some of them. What they do is they get a list of all the people, 50 mile radius around their, their used car lot. They send out a postcard and they list all the stuff that's in their inventory. So it's like, you know, I got a, I got a, you know, a 2000 Chevy Malibu. I got a, I got a 2006 Toyota Corolla, boom, boom, boom. Come on in and buy a car. Well, I got your postcard. I ain't buying a car this week. So that's an episodic purchase, and you're trying to make it an impulsive purchase. Bad idea. So what I recommended is that how, what you really want is that when they're ready to buy a used car, they're going to go to nobody but you. Hmm. How do you do that? You Brandy. become what I call a trusted advisor, before you become a transactional um, seller. And again, in your world, not as clear cut because I think you can turn a, re a reluctant buyer or a non-episodic buyer into an impulsive buyer with the right approach. That's why a postcard, I think, is also not ideal for you because they're probably ready to sell this piece of land. 
as opposed to I, I'm not buying a used car. My car's running fine. But the concepts are all the same. I want you to, I want everybody to get these concepts because they're really important. So what I suggested to the used car salesman was instead of sending out a postcard every week with what's in the inventory, send out a postcard one time and a, and a couple of times to get people to opt in to a blog on, you know, tips for buying cars. I, I, I'm making this up. I, it's, we don't have to get granular here. I'm just giving you yeah. an example. But all of a sudden, you start sending out a, a card that says, opt in, I want to send you this free report on five things that you'll notice it, when, when your used car salesman is lying to you. Or five things to know that the car you, that you're thinking about buying is a lemon. And you actually create content, whether you create it yourself or you go out and get it. I mean, there's great content there's this thing called the internet. I don't know if anybody knows about it, but you can actually, and I found out this thing yesterday. You can Google. I couldn't believe it. Um, so, you know, this direct mail dinosaur found out all this cool stuff recently. What was the most interesting thing I found out this week? I learned about Google, which was really cool. So anyway, I'm being very sarcastic. Um, I'm very, I'm very, I'm, I'm from New York. You're being, so. you're being sarcastic. I, I didn't notice, man. No, but I'm also being like, I, I want to make a point, which is yeah, 100%. that everybody can get their everywhere so yeah. how do you differentiate yourself so anyway it became a list building exercise not a selling of used car exercise and that in the postcards that you send out and when they go online to the weekly blog that you still have the listings of what's in your lot so that when the episodic purchase time comes for a used car there who are they going to go to who are they going to call ghostbusters right yeah. they're going to call you yeah, it's, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense. That's essentially what We Buy Ugly Houses did. Those in uh, Home Investor franchise, they did it with houses. So you got my wheels turning. I can see what that might look like if I were to apply it to land. But because our demographic is very podunk, like they're still living in the dinosaur ages, you know, they're still living back in the 1980s or whatever. Um, and they, a lot of them don't have computers or if they do, they have really spotty internet. They don't even know how to use an email. Um, so a lot of the people that we're working with are, you know, buying properties from, they're more comfortable with an offline medium. That's so if fine. I wanted to do like a long form copy, right? Like, a, like something that was not a postcard that was like, Hey, sign up for my monthly newsletter or something and you actually send it out in the mail like can't that's based fine on, it's the same that, principle. That kind of stuff that okay oh no, it's the same principle if, if you want to spend the How money they which sign up for it though like practically like i'm i'm super new school right so i understand an opt-in but like do do i send you out don't a, even have to have an opt-in to send them a, a paper newsletter do you know do you know that direct mail is still an opt-out medium not an opt-in medium you're aware of that right no. Can you explain? It's very important that? to know this. Yeah. That in email, everybody has to opt in. And if you, they don't opt in and you start sending them stuff, you can go to jail. It's yeah. called spam, right? And there are laws around it. And you need, and that's why people double opt in. In direct mail, if someone raises their hand or in the case of buying a compiled list that's in direct mail, you can send them, if you buy the list for unlimited use, you can actually keep sending them stuff. And as long as you should have an unsubscribe in there, but it's an opt out medium, meaning that you can send stuff to them indiscriminately for as long as you want. You don't want to be a jerk about it, but it's only until they unsubscribe. That has been the rule. Now it could change one day. Some politician could decide to make direct mail an opt in medium. The, the beauty of direct mail is that it's an opt out medium, not an opt in medium. What does that mean for your guys? That means you get a list. Now, here's another big thing. Base direct mail. There are two categories of lists. There are response lists and there are compiled lists. I'm sure you're dealing with compiled lists that you oh, get. Oh, no. We're, we're get buying um, more direct lists. Like, we're buying uh, out-of-state owners, tax delinquent, more, more niche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I say compiled, versus, let me give you the definition. Then you tell me whether you're response or compiled. A compiled list is the phone book with overlaid information on it. It has nothing to do with what they responded to in the past and what they did in the past. Yeah. A response yeah. list means there are people on a list who raised their hand for something, bought a magazine, bought a book, donated to a, a, a fundraiser, 
bought from a catalog, something that they responded to, response list, compiled list. Therefore, response lists are worth a lot more money. They're sold at a much higher price point, and they're usually for one-time use. Compiled lists, because they, there are people that are compiling these names with all kinds of demographic data, all kinds of census data, they, anybody can do it. And that's why you need, you asked about list sources, you need compiled list sources that guarantee deliverability that, but you can mail them as often as you want. You can make deals, I'm sure, where you can mail three times and you pay a fee, or you have unlimited use for a certain fee. That doesn't happen in the response list world. Mm -hmm. So now, here's the deal. If you bought a response list and it's one-time use, one-time rental, you can't do, I'm gonna keep sending a print newsletter to you every month. However, if you have a compiled list for unlimited use, you actually can create a subscriber list out of that, and it's all legal because it's an opt-out medium. Again, you don't wanna be a jerk. You wanna send them really good content. If I'm sending somebody a newsletter it and it's 100% sales, don't do that. You're defeating the whole purpose. Now, the question is, do you want to, does you, do you and your audience want to invest that much in content and being a trusted advisor in the flipping of land? And I, I, don't, I don't mean to sound derogatory when I say flipping of land. You oh, no, that's what we call it, yeah. Right, but, I, but how about calling it something else? Because that makes it sound like it's a commodity. Yeah. How about, you know, high end, you know, be, or best, I'll make something up, but I'm not going to write copy for you right now. But, <laughs> you know, best deal um, land investment or something, or, you know, most, um, most lucrative land investment, you know, and, and then come up with an acronym or something. So basically, you now have just taken yourself and put yourself above everybody else who's a land flipper into something called land investor consultant again i'm not these aren't the exact words and again you will i mean there's nobody i'm sure except the people listening to this that are thinking about creating content that would turn you into a trusted advisor and not just a transactional marketer now your business is all about transaction i'm sure a lot of people are one off they have one piece of land they need to yeah, sell everyone. it <laughs> Yeah. Right. Oh, so you don't have anybody that's ever going to have a second piece of land to sell? I've had one lead personally, anecdotally, that um, said that he had extra properties to sell, but he what hasn't about, sold it to me yet. All right, let me just open up your mind. What yeah. about going after people that have more than one piece of land? Yeah, I mean, that, that definitely happens. I've had that hundreds, it happens. hundreds of times. But it's the kind of thing where, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I see what you're saying, Brian. Like, this makes a lot of sense for a lot of companies and situations out there. But when I think about the, the typical person that sells their land to me, it's a very, it's like a, like a once in a lifetime event. And, and there's not something where I need to trust you for five years before I'll do anything. It's more like I've got this problem right now. I want somebody to give me easy. Okay. Then, then let's, then let's just take the same principle and say, how about trusting me for like five minutes before? Mm -hmm. And, and me personally, I want to give you cash for your vacant land. Doesn't smell like trust to me. What would smell like trust to me would be something like, you know, almost calling out the elephant in the room. If you think that all people that you could sell your land to are alike, think again. Or like, I don't know, I love the concept. I just wrote about this last week. You know, we did it in, you know, mil tens of hundreds of millions of pieces of direct mail of what I called smiling swindlers. And the world is full of smiling swindlers. And believe it or not, a lot of smiling swindlers are doctors, lawyers, accountants, uh, real estate brokers. Because if you position everybody else as a villain when you're the hero, that is positioning that separates you from, I want to give you cash for your vac vacant land. So for me, if I was going to test another postcard with a, with a subject line like this, if this is your subject line, maybe it's in that vein. So at least trust me for five minutes that I'm better than anybody else who you could sell your vacant land to. I understand that your market is not one that you're going to create a trust agreement with them for five years. Now, I will say though that, you know, the, the cardinal rule of any direct marketing, no matter what medium, is that the key to direct marketing is repeat business. And so 
if there's any way to create a repeatable, a repeatable business inside of the one-off business. The one-off business sounds like it's the big kahuna for you. Like selling you know, to one person, one piece of land, one-time event, goodbye, you're out of my life. We did a nice deal together. Love you. Goodbye. Right? Yeah. A lot of but, times that's how it works. Right. But there's another market that I'll bet no one is exploring, which is the repeat market. There's got to be a repeat market. I know people in my life that have multiple, that own multiple pieces of land. Do they want to sell them all at once? No. Do they yeah. want to sell it to people who will give them the best price? Now you want to buy really low and then sell a little bit higher. Right. I understand that it's not, it's not like this high end, you know, real estate business. I get it, but you can implement, I think a little bit more. I hate to use the, I'm not, I'm not being derogatory to what you're doing at all, but I think you can add some class. Somebody that, again, I think has done a very good example of this is home investors. Seth, you're familiar with uh, we buy ugly houses people, right? Mm -hmm. So it's wholesaling houses, right? So it's buying, it's exact, exactly what we're doing, but with houses. But they've branded themselves so much that when people think of, literally they've, they've, um, they've created a monopoly on the keywords, you know, we like we buy ugly houses or sell your house fast. Like there's all there's there's actually like I think like court battles over mm -hmm. um, the actual copy of those those. Yeah, keywords. I'm sure everybody as soon as they saw that they were doing well, everybody tried to rip them off. Yeah, so so like it could work. It would be a long term play, but and well, there'd be a lot of tests. Let's just brainstorm that. among the three of us. What 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 would be a differentiator for you? I think if you were trying to build like a national brand, like I want everybody everywhere when they have land to always think of me and no one else. Like, and, and if you're, if you're working on that level, like where you have like hundreds of millions of dollars to buy land with, I think that can make a ton of sense. I think however, when you're on our level or my level and Jaren's level, where like, you're not in a hundred million, you know, you're not a national. Why can't you have, why can't you have like champagne taste with, or, or champagne Champagne problems with with beer taste. I don't. Why can't you use like some that. of the techniques, even if that you're was not? That's good copy right there, Brian. Well, <laughs> no, but I'm just saying that. I I don't know. I'm look. I could be wrong, Seth. You have more experience than I do. I'm just going to challenge you, to, to in that. I think that you're looking for excuses. My opinion. You can tell me I'm full of it. I think you're looking for excuses of why I can't do that, as opposed to. Why can't I do something that differentiates us, even on a small scale, that makes us still the place to go to, to sell our land to, even in a small market, so that no one else can penetrate what we're doing? I mean, if most of the people we buy from are one-time sellers, like it's one and done, that's it, what is the benefit of trying to get into everybody's head and saying it's called copy and it's called actually getting them to do do what you want them to do that's so what's well, in it for you. I, I guess maybe a better question is you know having the copy on a postcard that says i want to give you cash for your land like why is that bad because it, it, it does work for a lot of people never said it was bad and you got you don't put words in my mouth never said it was bad. I, I, I didn't mean bad bad i mean you're talking about elevating the you already told me it's working you don't even need me <laughs> well no you don't i mean, even need me so I mean, so so that, that's how I'll start. I'll start the conversation is you don't need me to improve this. It's good. What I'm giving you is an alternative way. So to answer your question, if I only got one shot, I would want to let them know that I'm the only choice in town, that I'm the only one that they would want to go to. I want to give you cash for your vacant land, and I'm going to do it in a way that no one else will do it. I want to let them see me as the only choice. I think the, the, the issue is like, that's usually a given because there is nobody else else who's doing this. Not always, okay. but in a lot of markets, like it's not really a matter of me convincing people that I'm better than somebody else because I'm the only one doing it. So like, that's not really even a conversation, you know? Right. How has that happened? How is there no competition? It's I just mean, the nature of the, of the niche. But what I, I just want to jump in there because I, Seth, I could see this working if you wanted to be the quote unquote national Brown of one County. Right. So like if, if like I target Owen County, Indiana, 
and I become like, because motivation will happen at some point down the road. It might not be today, but if I am branding an area and I'm mm -hmm. reinforcing the mind of Owen County that, Hey, if I'm ever in a situation where I need to get rid of my property or I'm out of state and I own property in, in Owen County, who I just want to get rid of it. When, if that life event ever happens, I'm going to call Jaren. And that's where yeah. well, I, I think you've already can't. established, though, that my and, 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 and Seth was you know, very clear and I got it that we're not really looking for long term relationships here. I got that. And, and that's sort of anti what I do. But that's fine because that's the nature of this beast. And I get it. What I'm saying is that um, it sounds like if I'm the only one, if I'm the only game in town, then I can just make my town bigger. Can I? I mean, what prevents. The, what prevents you from going further out to more counties? What prevents you from being the guy in India in the state of Indiana? Your guys from expanding and being bigger in a in in, in bigger areas. And if I'm going to do that, why wouldn't I want to have messaging that separates me? Although if it's not if it's not relevant, then it's not relevant. I mean, but to answer your first question, nothing. And a lot of people do do that. They expand all over the place. It seems like I'm just trying to understand, like, like what would you change about the messaging? Because it, I, I just seem to be getting the vibe that, like, it's it could be better or it could yeah, no, because be, what, what I'm saying. So we're not develop. We don't we don't care about developing a long term relationship. I got mm -hmm. that. So that takes away a lot of the copy platforms that I like the best. Mm -hmm. um, but I still I still like the idea. You know, call. I mean, even the call right now. So what would be the call to action? What about, you know, it's sort of like, I, I'll use the example of, you know, the great direct marketers of all time in direct mail used to say that, you know, if you sell a membership or a subscription versus a magazine or a newsletter, it, it's a mindset, it's, it's a commitment. So the idea of, you know, call right now for a free 15 minute consultation on why we, you know, are the best at doing this. Um, is just a small little tweak that now turns you into not a because the call right now is just it's fine I'm sure it works I'm sure you get a lot of response so now am I calling you am I calling into a boiler room or am I calling into someone who actually is going to advise me so the idea of a free 15 minute consult on getting the most for your your land is just words I understand but that's why copy is important. And so if I wanted to sort of upgrade the, the look and feel of this, it would be something like, you know, um, not everybody can give you cash for your vacant land, but not everybody will give you the same. And again, maybe you can sell into like a, a, a weird customer service thing, even though it sounds like it's totally transactional. But what, are, what, are you, what do they know? They don't know that it's totally transactional. I mean, it's, you know, basically what I'm saying is like what you've got is a, I got your land, I'm going to buy low and then I'm going to sell it high. I just want to make a deal with you. Got it. Totally transactional. Anything you can do that makes that person feel like that you're a human being, that you're somebody that would be better to talk to than someone else. And again, the fact that you have no competition means that this is probably good enough. But maybe you get more people to call when they feel like they can trust you. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. If it doesn't lose an order or cause a rejection, it doesn't matter. That's another a rule of thumb that I've always lived by. To me, this could cause a rejection or lose an order if people think you're not legit. Potentially. Is there something so, you would do to make it look more legit? Like... Okay. Yeah, I would. I, I would actually, you know, why do uh, lawyers, when they get the list of people who just had an accident and they want to represent you in court, why does the, the smiling swindler, as it were, uh, and I'm not putting down ambulance chasers, nor am I putting down uh, lawyers, but I had the same conversation that I had with the used car salesman. Everybody's got the same list, right? When everybody, by the way, in a lot, I think in the state of Indiana, as a matter of fact, is one of those states, because I work with a, a, a personal injury attorney there, you get the list of people as soon as they get an accident 30 days after. So what do they get? They get 16 mailings from 16 different lawyers, been in an accident, call 1-800-I'll-fix-your-net.com, whatever. Um, 
So the idea there is that everybody can be the person that, so the legitimate thing for them that I suggested was similar to what I was suggesting to you, which doesn't work in your, in your niche, which would be to become a lawyer that actually knows what the hell they're talking about. And they're not just going to be, you know, an ambulance chaser. I even told them that you call the elephant in the room, which is a Dan Kennedy rule of thumb, you know, great marketer. He always says, call the elephant in the room. I said, you might think I'm an ambulance chaser and maybe I am, but I'm not like every other ambulance chaser, you know, but again, that's people with a lot of competition. Here's the thing of it. Most of these people that we're reaching out to are never going to do business with us because most people are not willing to sell their property for 10 to 20% of market value. So like it kind of, in my mind, like the list is 10 times more important than the mail piece. If you're talking to the right the list people, is always the most important thing. Yeah. If you're talking to the right people, then you probably can justify 15 minutes on the phone or hiring somebody or whatever. Um, so how but, good are your, how good, how good is your list selection? And that's, and that's actually part of what I wanted to get into. Let's talk about that. Cause yeah. you know what, if you have, I was making the assumption that you're, so let's talk about this. You, you wanted me to critique the postcard. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I critique the postcard. True. That's the copy. Mm -hmm. Just so you know where I come from is that I, I work on the 40, 40, 20 rule in direct response that 40% for the success of a campaign, 40% importance on the list, 40% importance on the offer, 20% on the copy. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the copy is half as important. However, you nailed it. If I send this thing to a list of people who are unqualified, I got zero chance. Mm -hmm. If I have a perfect list, I think Jaron even said it before, I have a perfect list and I can send anything to them and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some sales. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, so I call it the 41 39 20. So list is 41%. Let's get the list right so you're not fishing in the wrong barrel to begin with. I don't know what the list sources you use are and what kinds of things you can do to make that list more qualified, but you can. And then the offer would be the consultation as opposed to just call that you, and then the creative becomes more consistent with who you now have where you're fishing. So this becomes the bait in the water, but the, the, the fish in the water are way different. So yes, the list is the most important thing. Yeah. So now when, when it comes to, and we've, or I guess myself, I've used services like Asian Pro 24 seven data tree list source, real quest. Like I've used all those and with all of those services that all kind of work the same where they give you a lot of different filtering criteria. You can filter your recipients based on property type and the zoning and the value and the size and all kinds of stuff, which is really helpful. It's still though, does not perfect the process. Like there's still lots of people who will never respond to me. And do you know of any like rules that apply across the board where like, how do you make sure you're getting the best possible list? Like what are some common mistakes people make when they're doing this? So stuff? the compiled list more, I remember I, a different the yeah. response versus compiled, very, very different. Um, you know, the world I lived in in direct mail was all about response lists. So, mm -hmm those lists were people who already had either raised their hand, bought something, did something. So the more that you can get, even in the compiled list world, people who have actually responded to something, done something that they, I, I, I don't know if you get um, uh, uh, guarantees of deliverability. I think that's something you should absolutely demand from any list compiler. I don't know all of those list uh, compilers that you just mentioned. I know these big companies like Info USA that have every residence in the United States mm -hmm. and then they can overlay everything. So, you know, maybe what I would suggest is instead, and I, I assume that you're going after all the lists everybody else goes after in the real estate market, what kinds of things could you do that might be out of the box? So one of the things I would do is look, I, I would certainly look in the uh, SRDS which is the standard rate and data service, mailing lists and data. It's, it used to be a big directory when we used to have books. Books were like, that was when the, uh, before the big bang. Um, what's a book? Yeah. What's a book? <laughs> um, but SRDS online is all, it's all online now. And I, I think you have to subscribe, but it's not that expensive. Um, and I would really spend, I mean, you nailed it as far as like tips. Um, I don't know a lot about the compiled list market, but what I would say is, you know, guarantees of deliverability, getting the list owner or the compiler to, to give you as much information 
of how these names were put together, where they came from. Again, once they start guaranteeing deliverability, you know that they've had to update them mm -hmm. on a regular basis, otherwise they won't be deliverable. Are they names as opposed to just resident lists? What was the methodology of the compilation, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would ask them a lot of questions about that. Do they, do they answer those questions? Do they check boxes for you or what? Yeah, well, I know, I know the answers to a lot of those. It's, I mean, the way they get this data is typically from the county recorder or the registered deed. So like it's actual like uh, public records of who owns what. And there's, it's a very imperfect system. It's, it's pretty common to get a bunch of mail returned to you because it wasn't delivered. And part of the problem is... Well, that's a pro they have to guarantee that if they're selling you a list at a certain cost per thousand, they should probably guarantee you deliverability at least. Even if not. Any of the main ones that I know of, like listsource.com, none of them guarantee that. I don't know though. I mean, again, I would go there. there again, I'd go to standard rate and data service. <coughs> I'd start looking at the most reputable list compilers. Now, the other thing you can do too, and again, I don't, I, I can't dig into your entire business here, but I would say that there's a lot of opportunities to buy overlay information once you buy the basic list. So the idea is buying the list and then there's a lot of census data that you can buy data and you can overlay by things that you would know that are more obvious of people who might own land that might be willing to sell. Yeah, we, we have certain criteria that, that we do. Like we hit um, only properties that are in counties within like less than 100 people per square mile and that are within you know two hours of a major metropolitan area. That's I important. hit a lot of people out of state you know, well, that, that's, that's, I, 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 I think what Brian is saying is that like, you can get a separate source of data apart from where you, where you got the list to sort of cross check it and maybe even add more layers of filtering onto it. Like uh, how it, about net worth? How about, you know, yeah, household huge. income? Mm -hmm. How about, um, you know, there's so much data of people that have been like on warranty cards and people like you may you may find out and one of the things you should try to find out is do you have a do you have a list now of all the people you've ever sold to bought yeah. and sold um no, I, not. I mean it's not not organized but yeah i could if i really wanted to i could probably so here's here's another here's another way to sort of if if you could ever do this this would be the key to refining your list selection it's actually and this will sound so stupid when i say it but it's actually the key to everything and it's called it's called you want to go get people that look like the ones you've already yeah. got. Yeah, lookalike audience. Yeah, yeah, it's not just lookalike. So let me go a step further. Mm -hmm. What we did in direct more, and lookalike is good, but lookalike is like the base level. Quick story. So I did a podcast once with a guy who wanted me to talk about how we did what we called regression modeling in direct mail. And what regression modeling is, it's not lookalike modeling. What regression modeling is, is that when we were selling subscriptions, we would go out, and we would get people to subscribe to our newsletter. What we would do then, or buy a book, and what we would do is because they were already on our file of people who already bought from us before, and we knew something about them, we would then take those buyers and profile them and go back out to the rest of the universe of names that we already own, and it was a lookalike, but it was based on the transaction data, what they bought, how they bought. You don't have a lot of that. But a lookalike is the next best thing. So anyway, I did this podcast. The guy puts the podcast on Facebook and some guy writes in and goes, wow, this was such an interesting interview with Brian Kurtz. He, I, I thought Facebook invented lookalike models. You know, this has been going on since the 1960s that, that you know, Reader's Digest was doing regression modeling in the 1960s because they wanted to go out and select names that look like people that already bought from them. So what I would do, if there's any way to take a list of people that, again, they're all one shot people that you've bought land from, but if they're like, what if you found out, I'm making this up, but what if you found out that all of those people had a propensity to live, I mean, you probably know they're rural or whatever, but they, they were like bunched up in certain um, uh, SCFs or states or zip, oh, most of your people are local, but if there was anything that was a common denominator that you could then go out and use that as selection criteria yeah. when you went back out. I just want to get people's minds thinking yeah. about that without getting crazy with, with, you know, hiring a PhD in statistics. So for, 
for us millennial minds, like practically, how do I go about doing a, a regression a regression modeling type approach in direct mail, like offline? You don't have to do. I mean, you're not going to have to do a regret, but you, if you can get the list in shape of people who have already been your customers, and then figure out what and, and find out what they have. might. I mean, you have their addresses, right? Yeah. Why not send them a survey with a dollar and ask them a couple of questions? I mean, there's a bunch of ways. You want to get as much information. You, now your response could probably be, well, I don't want to waste my time doing that because I can go out with this to a new list and I'll get whatever I can get, which is fine. That's an acceptable answer. Hey, man, but I, if you I want to go wanna... deeper as opposed to wider, the only way to go deeper and finding more people that are already your customers is to ask them. like. Wouldn't you want to know, like, what, like, shit, I would want to know everybody I bought a piece of land from if they had another piece of land. I mean, yeah. I certainly want to know that because maybe you don't even know that they have a second piece of land. And would they, they, now you make the assumption that if they had a good experience with you, that you'd be the first person they'd call. But actually the survey could trigger conceivably a second sale. So basically, if they have a second property which most of them don't i understand that wouldn't you want to be the buyer of that piece of land and yeah why wouldn't so here's another rule of thumb of direct marketing <laughs> direct mail and every model whether it's a lookalike model or a regression model is all based on rfm do you know what rfm is i do but I do. our audience probably doesn't okay so rfm is recency frequency monetary value every single model i ever built and again millennial no millennial statistician, no statistician, you always want to build your list based on recency, frequency, monetary. So, and there are variations of that. As Perry Marshall teaches, sometimes it's recency, frequency, and time as opposed to monetary. Let me explain briefly. Recency, someone who responded more recently is worth more than someone who didn't. So in your case, even if they, you, you bought their land recently, they may not have a second piece of land for you to buy from them but they certainly would respond to something on a follow-up. Have you ever followed up with anybody who's ever, you've ever bought from? Mm -mm. So why wouldn't I want to follow up with a, a I'm going to call it a satisfaction survey, but that's probably going to make you, make you wretch a term like that. Like, why do I want to like be in a relationship with these people? I bought their land. Goodbye. But hey, real quick, let me, let me just pause right there. Cause I just want to go back to what you were saying earlier I think that there's a lot there about developing a relationship and long-term branding. I was, before I started in the land business, I worked for one of the largest nationally, whatever, wholesale companies in Indianapolis. And the thing that brought us on the map was this long-term relational approach. We mainly did it for our buyers than we did for, for sellers, but I saw it firsthand work and distinguish a company on a national worked. scale. Every, look. Everything's not a revenue event. Everything's a relationship event. And, However, and the thing, and the in thing your is, business, it's not as much. Well, but the thing is, is right now, my little rinky-dink postcard is working, but competition is increasing. And there are a lot of people getting into the land business. Right. Because so now, now, you're giving me, now you're giving me a new story. You already, you already dismissed me before because you said I have no competition. Well, so we don't have competition where I'm at. There's only certain areas where there's high competition, but I know that the lay of the land, it's going to get more and more competitive. Then and in this that is case, stuff I, that I, distinguishes so you. No. I already gave up my other, my other points. I already like deferred and said I'm full of shit. But now <laughs> I'm not full of shit anymore. Because actually, if you have competition, everything I said about differentiation is actually re relevant. I mean, it may be I don't, and Seth doesn't because of the markets that we're in, but places like Arizona or Florida, or parts of Texas, there's competition there. Look, all I know is what I'm teaching today yeah. has relevance, whether it has relevance to everybody, it never does. I mean, in my family, nobody in my family think I have relevance in anything, anytime. <laughs> so if I, have, if I have this much relevance to this much of your audience, God bless me, I'm having a good day. <laughs> RFM says that recency is the most important thing frequency is and so is monetary so it, i think i think that you could learn a lot about how you're going to go out after new lists to understand the list that already work for you what's a list that already work for you if someone became a customer of yours 
and you bought land from them, that's a successful transaction. Why wouldn't I want to know as much about that? I would actually, and now you can say, I'm not going to invest in phone. I'm not going to invest in follow-up. I'm not going to invest in, 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 that's fine. That's your choice. If it was me and I had a little extra cash, instead of like spending it on, I mean, I, I would want to know, like after the transaction, I wouldn't mind having either a couple of survey questions and give them a dollar bill to, to answer them or actually getting them on the phone for a few minutes. What did we do right? What did we do wrong? Um, what, would you, what do you think that we could do that would have made the, the experience better? You don't know what you're going to learn because you've never followed up with anybody you ever did a transaction with. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. So that's and, and more recent. You'll get a better response than, than not more recent. Frequent. If anybody is more than once, shit, I'd want to be on the phone with them. I'd want to go visit them. God, I used to make the, I have a thing in my new book about, you know, the one, the one time buyer versus the 16 dime buyer, the 16 time buyer. I want to invite them over to my house for dinner, for God's sake. So yeah. I want to know everything about the person that I did business with and what they're, what they, why they did business with me. Now the monetary piece, yes, you could do it based on a dollar figure but that might not be as relevant as the time figure. You know, Perry talks about the amount of time that someone spends with you either online or offline or the amount of time you spend with them is a factor in this relationship. And so again, you know, if you know, I'd want to find out, I'd want to talk to people who came really close. I mean, I, so, I assume you have people who you almost made a deal with, yep. but then didn't. Is that right? Yep. Hey, you, did you ever follow up with them? Like, why not? Or is it like, let's go on to the next one because all I got to do is sell more. I think a lot of times the reason deals don't work out is because understandably our prices are really, really low. And there's just, there's just no way around that. I mean, just, that's what it has to be. I think though, Seth, and like maybe I'm just giving a little pushback uh, uh, to your direction. Unacceptable. <laughs> You're fired. You're fired. No, <laughs> uh, no but, and by the way, this is a good discussion because I am not, you know, you've given me a lot of reason for pause on some of the things that I've suggested, but I'm not taking anything back on 404020, on RFM, yeah. on surveying your customers. Those things are universals and some version of that can be incorporated into any business, but go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, I understand that most people reject us because we're offering such an insane amount of money for their property, but for the right person, yeah, it's insanely low. low, but, but for the right person, there's still value that we're adding because for the right person, them getting rid of a painful property or giving them fast cash in their pocket, there's still value there at any given, like there are people out there that need our company right? Like need us buying their property, at least in their world and their mindset and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. They need cash, but that's why I know why you led with cash here, but the actual other two benefits over here about, the, about back taxes and closing costs. Yeah. Those might be as important. Like, like why wouldn't I want all of that in my big headline, which is, you know, you know, cash for your vacant land and, you know, I, I, they, I mean, yes, you can say they read it after they read the headline, but the headline is always what they read. I was curious why you had that smaller, whereas why wouldn't it be equal? Because you have no idea which entry point is going to be the thing. There are a lot of people that might have had an experience of the insanely low price. I can't deal with this. Plus, I got taxes. Plus, I got closing costs. You just yeah. gave them two more reasons why you and not anybody else, if there is competition, or if there's no competition, you gave them two more reasons why they should pick up the phone. And I feel like it's not buried. It's on the postcard. But why wouldn't that be equally as important? Yeah. Well, let me ask you this, Brian. And this is actually a question that's been in my mind for the past 20 minutes. So I really want to <laughs> get this in. When you talk about having a separate set of data to kind of overlay on top of the first list you got, something that I've been trying to do over the past year is find good deals on farmland, which is very, very difficult. A lot of people are, are not willing to sell farmland. Yeah, if it, I guess if it's, if it's got like the ability to deliver crops. It's, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, it's just a, it's a great piece of property if it, if it produces. Um, but I think there are very specific types of people in certain situations. For example, 
if a farmer has died and they're passing their land on to their children, their children don't want it. So is there, where would I go to find this kind of stuff? You guys, there, I, again, there are lists for everything. I think that you probably can find yourself to list sources that are all in the quote unquote real estate market. I think you want to go to the companies that are starting with every household in the United States. The one that pops into my head is Info USA, but there are a bunch of others. Mm -hmm. um, and then all the different overlays. I was, I think you were going to go a different direction. I mean, you can get, you can get, uh, you know, death records are public, and so you could overlay death records on top of farm ownership. I'm sure there's a way to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But I thought you were looking more. I think I, I, bankruptcy records are are readily available. Mm, yeah. I'd rather, mm -hmm. I, I assume you go after foreclosed properties and all of that, right? Uh, so, sort of, not exactly. Um, I think those are the people that, the, to me, those are the people that would react the most positive. I want to give you cash. I don't know anybody, and I've known a lot of people, unfortunately I've not been through a bankruptcy myself, but I know a lot of people who have, and one of my best friends is a bankruptcy attorney. I, I know that cash is king. Now, of course, if they have secure creditors, it's, it's complicated. I get all that. But, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not claiming. But I would say that, you know, the idea of, you know, foreclosed property. Now, do you buy land if it's got, could it have a house on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. Yeah. So I, have you, do you explore well, foreclosed what would, properties? What would be interesting is if somebody got foreclosed on at their primary residence, and then they also were a, a land owner because that would be a really good motivator because it would show like, okay, these guys are definitely distressed and they have this extra piece of property that if we target, they would definitely want to sell it most likely. So that's, right. a, that's a way. Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. But I think that, I guess my point is like, I'm not, I can't be your list broker. I can't, you know, that's not, I, I, you know, I got, unfortunately I'm not, I'm not that, I'm not that guy. I could be that guy if I chose to be, I'm not that guy right now in my life. So uh, I used list brokers my whole life. Um, there are people that, you know, if you can get a really good customer service rep at a big list compiler that you, look, I would, I would go after, I'd be start being really creative. You already are when you talked about deceased farm owners. Um, I think being creative when you can overlay bankruptcy information. Um, I think that you want to start being super creative because Seth, you're the guy, you hit it on the nail on the head earlier in this conversation when I was, you know, answering your questions about this, when we know that you don't want to even worry about this until the list is right. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't know your marketplace enough. I mean, I, I don't, but I got to believe, I know that creating compiled lists of all different, you know, sizes and shapes are, you know, that's all doable. Getting a really good rep. At, I mean, I assume that what you're buying from these companies probably is much more commoditized in the in the compiled list area than kind of being creative about how can I create a list that's going to be so much better than anything I mailed before. And I think it's unacceptable to go out with 1,100 pieces and get no responses. I mean, yeah. now it could it might say that this is when you get the list from them you want to insert decoys in it to make sure it gets delivered. That's another little tip. Well, that, that exact postcard that you have was a return mail from that post. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking that, about when you buy the list, you, where do you, what do you do with it? You send it to like some service bureau to. to yeah. Click to letter mail. Shop. Yep. So at the letter shop, have them insert names like fake names at real addresses of people in the, it's all, it's all regional, right? In a certain area. Yeah. So what you do is you, you get, a, get a bunch of friends of yours in the area to just accept their, give them their address with a fake name and you put that into the list when they send these out. So they, and if they don't get one, then you know the thing wasn't delivered and you, have, you put a bunch of those in there. Do you ever decoy your list? Well, that, that is a decoy of the list because it came, it came back to me um, from the, the campaign. Was that delivered to no, you? Here? No, that's not what I'm talking Wait, about. We're not talking oh, about yeah, return. a return. Okay, I got this you. This is called so a Nixie. No, you. this is called I, a I'm Nixie. Tracking. A Nixie means it comes back because it was undeliverable. I'm saying you plant names in, in the list to make sure that the list 
compiler is yeah. is is being honest that idea. they actually mail the thing. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Well, yeah, it's 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 a it's what every big direct mail company does. You decoy the list. There are actually comp if you mail millions of names across the country, we used to hire a company that hired people to be decoys in lists. And they get the decoys, they send them to a central place, and then we get a report to see that all of our names were delivered around the country. So I got my decoy in Idaho, I got the decoy in Montana, I got a decoy in Delaware. So now I know I got at least delivery, it was at least delivered. If yeah. you get zero, did your decoys get something in the mail? Then you go check with them. Well, and there, I mean, there could be all kinds of reasons why it was zero. I mean, it could be the types of people you were, like that was, I think, my issue with the farmland was that people with farmland just aren't motivated to sell. Like not, not, awesome. not, not like the other types of people I've normally sent to in the past. No, that's um, absolutely true. But, but it also could be that somebody ripped you off. Like somebody gave you a bad list and, or a letter shop didn't actually, or, you know, I hate to say it, but we once had a situation where we found out about a postal worker in, Chicago, who was burying sacks of mail in his backyard. I'm using okay. that as a, as a, wow. as a, as a, <laughs> That's uh, a bad day. <laughs> I'm being anecdotal to show you that there are a lot of ways where you could get screwed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Brian, one last question about the, uh, you know, creative lists and overlaying lists on top of each other. I understand at a high level how to do that. However, I've never actually done it. Is there like, like, should I be working with a list broker and having them them do this for me? Yeah. So, um, how, do you, how do you find these list brokers? Well, SRDS. So, you know, all the list brokers are listed in there. Mm -hmm. Usually, list brokers who work on a on a on a broker commission are actually working with bigger mailers in mm -hmm. national mailers, and they're they're actually doing more in the response list area, not the compiled list area. With compiled lists, it's not that you need a list broker per se but you need someone at one of these companies that becomes sort of your customer service rep mm -hmm. that can guide you and maybe you either pay them a fee to do that or maybe they take a piece. Like if they, they, they might just take a 10 or 10% 10 commission out of where they go to the list source, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I've never bought compiled lists on a big scale, even though, I mailed 2 billion pieces. They were all response lists. Hmm, so I always cool. used it, but I never would go out. I would never leave my home. I never left home without a list broker. Yeah. So never I, not work with a list broker. Let me, it, let me just it's ask, different in the compiled world. Let me ask a, a clarifying question on the response list. So if, just to give an example for our industry and our niche, right? Like, would it look like somebody who's a landowner who also subscribes to like country music magazine or something like it that. It could be that, but what about, is there actually a magazine called landowner magazine or is there a, a real estate ownership magazine or whether it's a trade publication or um, they call it controlled circulation. There's two kinds of circulation in magazines There's controlled and paid paid means I pay you 29 bucks for a subscription control means I filled out a card that qualifies me to get a subscription. I don't know if there are controlled circulation magazines that would be a high percentage of people, but that's a response list even though they didn't pay me cash for that. So those are all listed as well. Are there magazines that you can then select in zip codes? They'll be more expensive than a compiled list, but they raise their hand, they filled out a postcard to be qualified to, and I don't know, are there magazines that people who own land subscribe to? Hunting magazines all day. You just, you just identified another thing. What if I understood all the people that bought from me were all hunters? That's an overlay you can get, no problem. Because warranty cards today, if you've ever filled out a warranty card for, there used to be a company out in Colorado called uh, National Demographic and Lifestyles. I don't know where it is today and who, bought, who owns it. I assume it's Abacus, which is a big compiler of consumer data in Colorado. But if you buy a hair dryer from some companies, there'll be a warranty card there. Attached to the warranty card is like a thing where you check off all the things you're interested in. Camping, fishing, you know, electronics, music, and then you send that in. That's actually put on a compiled list, but it's actually now a quasi-response list. Hmm. And all of that information is used for overlays on other people's lists. So this is like a deep dive that you need to do to see if you can kind of beat out all the other people who are mailing the same list. It's the same with the, the lawyers in Indiana 
who are male on the same list of people who are in an accident. Yeah, I, as I think through it, it, it sort of seems like my goal, realizing this will never happen, but still my goal should be to get a 100% response or acceptance rate. Like I want this list to be perfect. I mean, if, if I'm at least shooting for that and, you know, getting as much. Not a bad, not a bad way. I mean, you know, the best I ever did was probably 5%, but you know, um, you know, but 5% is better than zero. And, you know, think about what we do in email today. 0.0006, you know, it's like, you know, direct mail, you know, you start getting, you know, they used to always call it the 2%, right? Um, 2% response rates on, on higher ticket items is really acceptable. I mean, when I got two to 3% response rates, on a $30 newsletter offer, you know, based on my renewal rates and what I cross sell them and all of that, 2% was fine. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, shooting for a hundred percent, I'm with you. Mm. Go for it. Do you guys mind if we land the ship with um, a question about how you split test offline? Cause again, I'm learning a lot about online marketing right now and I understand how you split tests. It's really easy, but I don't know, like if I wanted to split test between a postcard, a long form copy, like, you know, uh, uh, like a newsletter or something like that. Like how do I actually take a county and split test those things? It's hard. Um, and especially with smaller quantities, you don't want to split test too fine. I, I don't know how many names you're mailing at a time, but you need to get enough response to see if it's statistically statistically significant. Um, you know, we used to test 5,000 name segments of a new creative package, even we were mailing millions at a time, but they were, you know, um, each list segment was 5,000. Actually, our creative segments were 25,000 names. That's probably unrealistic to think about. But the concept is what we call A-B list testing, which I know you're aware of because if you've done it online, there are online programs that do it for you. But A-B list testing means that you have a, a universe of names in direct mail. And if you're going out, obviously someone's mailing these for you at a letter shop, they should have the ability to take an A-B split, meaning that if you want to just test one creative across the whole thing, depending on how many names it is, you'd want to do name A means name one in the sequence, in zip code sequence, because you don't want to just do split the list in half and send half to one and half to the other. It's got to be geographically and demographically similar. So you want to do, um, it's called nth naming in an AB split, meaning that every second name gets a different piece. So the first name, in, and all names are, are given to you in zip code sequence. So even if you're all in one county, it starts at one zip code and ends with another in order. So I'd want the first name that I got getting uh, creative one, the second name get creative two, the third name gets creative one again, the fourth name gets creative two again. They might all be living on the same block or within a area, but you don't have any geograph geographical bias that way. Mm. That's the best way, simplest way to do it. Now your total number of names will determine whether you can do more than one test at a time because you want to be able to know that, you know, we used to say a hundred net responses to a $30 offer was what we wanted to see to be, have statistical significance. I don't think you can get that, but if you have some track record of what kind of response rates you normally get to really prove whether that was a good list or not, that's probably how many names you want to see to see if one thing beats another and how many names do you need to mail to get that response rate, you, you kind of back into how many names you need to mail. Mm -hmm. So there's no rule of thumb, but I told you, we did 25,000 names for a, a new creative test. So we would have a million names. We would carve out an nth of the million and do this kind of A-B split testing for the 25,000 segments. Mm -hmm. um, so the same principle applies, just way smaller numbers. But you want to make sure that you're testing, you know, and you want to test single element testing, we call it single variable testing, or if you're testing a completely new creative approach, then go, go balls to the walls and just test two separate things, and that's your test. Mm -hmm. Or if you just wanted to test, I'll make this up, you just wanted to test putting all three of these items in a headline, that's the only thing that you would test. You wouldn't change something else on the back if you did that. And you want to see if that's going to move the needle. My guess is you want to do something big and radical. So I would make a big test of two things, A, B, 
and what you're going to test. I would even think about testing like an envelope package against the postcard with a letter with a, on the outer envelope saying, you know, open this for, you know, the best way to sell your land and never pay back taxes and never pay closing costs. Mm-hmm. So it would be like a teaser on an envelope that, you know, we didn't ever even got to formats and all that, but that's what I would probably want. I wouldn't want it. I mean, testing another postcard against this would be the easiest, but why wouldn't I want to test something in an envelope against it? Radically different. You have the suspense of an outer envelope. You're not looking at, remember, not everybody gets the postcard and reads this first. I hate to tell you, but you pull shit out of your envelope, out of your mailbox, you might be reading this first. Mm-hmm. Now you're mm-hmm. going to flip it. I get it. But what, a, what an envelope package does, it forces everybody's yep. um, eyes to the outer envelope. The outer get- envelope, as Bill Jamie, one of the great copywriters of all time said, the outer envelope is the hot pants on the hooker. I mean, yeah, I like that. That's hilarious. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's true. I, I know me personally, if I get something that looks like uh, somebody sent me a card in the mail, I'm opening it, even if it's a promotional thing, just 100% of the time. Well, no, I would definitely, but I'd want to still, like, wouldn't want to be half-assed about it. I'd want to have compelling copy. I'd want to, you know, you, do, you can do a lot more than, again, go back to real estate figuratively. You've got way more than this to tell a little bit of a story. You know, we've been out there for a long, why don't you sell your track record? You know, I've been out there, you know, buying land more than anybody in this area. You probably even don't know that your land is what what it's worth. I'm your guy. So Mm -hmm. even if you don't want to develop, going back to your point, Seth, you said, I don't really want to be in a long-term relationship. It doesn't make sense for this business. But if you don't want to be a long-term relationship for five years or a year, how about for 15 minutes? I can swing that. Why not? Mm-hmm. Like, why not? Why wouldn't I want to try to create a relationship with you that's more than this? Mm-hmm. That would be the test I would make. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. I can totally I would do like a probably an envelope package. I'm not going to write it for you. I could, but I won't. I'm way too expensive. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brian, I just want to say that I'm massively disappointed because I'm not leaving this interview crying. But no, you should, <laughs> but you got a lot of things you can test. Yeah, no, I, no, it was great. I really, really appreciate your time. I, I know you're a busy guy, so coming on our show is, is yeah, great. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, no, and I, 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 I wish you luck. I think you got a very interesting – what I liked about our discussion is that, you know, you, you didn't give me a lot of yeah buts. You gave me a few, but that was okay. But yeah, butts never work, by the way. You never want to do yeah, butts. <laughs> but what you did beautifully, and I, and I really appreciate it, actually, is you said, yeah, but this is the issue we're dealing with. So once I knew that everybody was more of a one-time buyer, once I knew that everybody's big thing was that uh, what I call reverse sticker shock, mm-hmm. that price is way too low. Mm-hmm. Um, so once I got a sense of your business, I tried to work my concepts in. So it was actually... Um, what I normally don't like, which is a yeah, but conversation, but your yeah, buts were really helpful. So hopefully I could then give you the rules of thumb. And then how do we apply relationship 40, 40, 20 RFM in a business that has those issues that are different? They're definitely different. Now, I do think that one of the big things we came up with was that the list is most important, which we all agree on. I'm really glad we all agree on that. And if you can like beat, beat everybody else to list sources that no one else is doing and you can be super creative, I already like the way you're thinking. It's a little maudlin, but you know, dead farmers, it's, you know, it's, it's <laughs> makes you feel shitty on the one hand, but it's, it's a fact of life, um, but bankrupt and all that. I mean, it, it sounds like a little exploitative, but you know what? If you treat it as you're creating an opportunity for somebody as opposed to taking advantage of them, now we're talking about a good conversation, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm going into a family that needs money because someone in there, because the patriarch or matriarch died and they have land, but I'm going to be this, I'm going to solve their problem. I'm not there to take advantage of them. That's what a letter in an envelope can do that a postcard can never do. Can't you see a letter starting with if it went to people that you knew had the death in the family or that they needed cash that you say, I've seen so many people in your position. I know that you might need some cash for your land and I really want to help you. You start actually wanting to help people instead of just wanting to do a transaction changes the whole conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It seems and like I could put that on a postcard though. That's not a lot to say. 
No, you could do it on a postcard. I think it's more powerful in a letter, mm -hmm. you know, well, on and, a letterhead that doesn't yeah. look like a sales letter. Yeah, you, have, like, you, have, you have like the confidentiality aspect of it too. It's not like everybody can read what you're telling, you know, saying to them. You might even want to put on the envelope personal and confidential. Mm, interesting. Deeply yeah, and irrevocably okay. personal. Mm -hmm. You know, this can never be, this can never be personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's another thing that you're testing when you can test an envelope against a postcard. Mm -hmm. But yeah. There is, I, I think the best thing I said to you today, if I had to pick something I said to you that I really, I'm really super proud of, is that you don't have to create a relationship for a year, a month, at least create one for like an extra few minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As somebody that can who, make a huge, huge difference. Yeah. As somebody who hates relationships in general, that's a huge relationship. <laughs> <laughs> so now we know where, you know, now we know where we're really coming from. We all really hate people. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I like people. If I, hey, that's, I'm not that's in true. camp. That's true. does. <laughs> yeah, I, really, I really do. I'm, um, I'm real I'm relational. Not, I do have to jump off. All right, my friend. Thank you so much. Oh, for the I, I wanna, if people want to get my stuff, they can go to briankurtz.me, which you said at the beginning. Um, and you have a new I, book coming out, right? What's that? You have a new book coming out, right? I have a new book coming out. You'll hear about it. If you just, if you just get on my list. Mm -hmm. briankurtz.me. I don't do affiliates. I don't sell a lot of stuff. I sell only educational materials and direct marketing. I blog every Sunday. Um, a lot of the things I spoke about at Perry's event were off blogs that I've done in the past. And, you know, they're just, it's a really, really great to be in my online family. I encourage everybody who's listening to just go to briankurtz.me, opt in. You won't be sorry. You can unsubscribe anytime. It's an opt. It's an opt-in medium, not an opt-out medium. And and I just want to say, I just want to reiterate that at the high-level pay marketing roundtable thing with all these high-level marketers, there were people that said Brian was on the only out of like two or three different people that they subscribed to. He was one of the ones that was mutually subscribed to. So like his stuff, he can't say this because it'll sound like he's a pompous jerk, but he actually is really solid. So you guys should check. Thank it you. Out. No, it's I, I enjoy writing. I enjoy teaching. I hope it came off today. I wasn't trying to be like, uh, you know, didactic. I wasn't trying to like talk to you from on high or anything like that. And I, I think I did a couple of times and I apologize if I did that. I only did that to kind of show you that these principles are, are fundamental, they're eternal, and we need, we can't apply them to any business, but every business is different. I get that. And we got to nuance it for what you guys do. So um, I hope you saw that I'm not a pompous jerk. I try not to be. There's a thin line between confidence and arrogance. Yeah. And uh, I am confident. You know, I, I know my stuff, but I, I, don't, I never want to be arrogant. And I never want to claim to know it all. And just the fact that I'm in, I go to Perry's and I'm there as a student as much as a teacher should tell you. I spend over $100,000 of my own money a year to be in other people's mastermind groups. So I'm always educating myself. So I'm not a pompous jerk. And um, if I am and anybody accuses me of it, I apologize now in advance if that's how you feel about me. Fine. I guess I don't hate you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Knowing that you don't hate me after being on the phone with an hour with me, you just made my day. Wasn't easy, awesome. but we got through. <laughs> yeah, we got there. It wasn't easy, right? Awesome. Good, good luck what? with all you're up to. Thank you. Yeah, man. So that's our interview with Brian Kurtz. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It's kind of interesting back and forth. Um, yeah, it was like the first. It was like the first time I saw Seth really get mad on the air. He was like, he was all red in the face. Oh wait, that's your sunburn. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It is a sunburn. That's true. Um, yeah, no, it. it uh, it was a very interesting conversation. I definitely got some good nuggets out of there. I think we sort of had to get past the, you know, him understanding the specifics of how, you know, our business is. I mean, it's admittedly very unique. It's different than a lot of stuff out there. Um, but once we got past that, I think we, we started getting into some really good stuff. If you guys want to hear the show notes for this episode, I know we mentioned a bunch of different resources as we always do. This is episode number 34. So you can go to retipster.com forward slash three, four, and you can find all the stuff we talked about and find a video of our conversation. Um, so be sure to uh, check that out. I just want to mention that I'm going to be intentional too when this comes out to put my before postcard back in front and then whatever I decide to do 
different. I don't know what I'm going to do. Didn't and get I a lot of specifics there, but but I but there were some good high level high level principles. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to figure out. I'm going to re-listen to the the episode and figure out what I'm going to change and do different, and then I'll let you guys know. And if mm-hmm. I get actual results from it, then I'll I'll post it here. But I might do a blog post to follow up with that or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and something else I'll just mention in passing because I feel like never talk about this. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind. Head over to iTunes, give us a review, whether you love the show, whether you hate it, just we want your honest feedback, let, you, let us know what you think about it, and if you're not already subscribed, then subscribe, I think you'll like it. Yeah. Um, so thanks again everybody for listening, we seriously appreciate having your, your eyes and your ears, if you're listening or watching, however you consume this uh, episode, we appreciate you guys so much, uh, thanks for everything that you do and being part of our community, and we will talk to you next time.